Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rahul Nadkarni. I'm from the University of Washington. And I'm going to be talking about our work in sparse plus low rank graphical models of time series. Uh, this is joint work with Nick Foti, advised by Casey Lee and Emily Fox. Uh, I want to start by talking about our motivating application, which is inferring a network of interactions between brain regions from MEG data. Uh, MEG is a neuroimaging technology that works by capturing a weak magnetic field generated from electrical activity in the brain, uh, giving a set of raw recordings over time. These recordings are then passed through what's known as an inverse solution to give an estimate of the underlying electrical activity that caused the recorded values. And you can essentially think of this as a multivariate time series with some unknown underlying structure. So our goal in this case is to estimate or, or get an estimate of uh, what neuroscientists refer to as functional connectivity, uh, which is a measure of relatedness between interacting brain regions. This idea of functional connectivity is actually very related to the statistical concept of conditional independence. Uh, so our idea was to develop a method for learning graphical models of time series, and then apply this method to the MEG data to learn a functional connectivity network. Uh, let me start by just doing a quick review of uh, graphical models. Uh, so a graphical model consists of a set of nodes uh, corresponding to random variables and a set of edges indicating conditional independence relationships between those variables. Specifically, what this means is that if there's uh, no edge between nodes i and j in the graphical model, then the random variables x i and x j are conditionally independent given the remaining variables. So in this case, uh, x1 and x2 are conditionally independent given the remaining variables in the graph. Uh, however, we're dealing with data that is in the form of multivariate time series. So our notion of conditional independence here is uh, slightly more nuanced. Uh, what we want is uh, conditional independence that accounts for interactions at all lags between the two series, and also removes the linear effects of the entire trajectories of other series. Uh, so these two properties actually align very well with the neuroscience definition of functional connectivity. Uh, there's some existing work in learning graphical models of time series, some examples of which are shown here. Um, but there's even more limited work learning graphical models of time series while incorporating latent structure. Uh, so you can think of an example where we have a set of observed variables with some conditional independent structure between them uh, that are affected by uh, interactions with latent variables. If we uh, marginalize out over these latent variables, uh, what we end up getting is a graph that is a lot more dense than one we, that we would expect. And what we really want is to be able to decompose this into a sparse component between observed variables and this latent component that removes all these spurious connections. Uh, there's some existing work uh, in applying this latent structure to learning graphical models of IID data. Um, but the work in doing this for graphical models of time series is limited. Uh, so both of these properties, uh, the conditional independence between time series and uh, latent structure, are important in the case where we're applying this to MEG data. Um, and I'm going to talk about this more as we go on. So I want to start with uh, the idea of how graph structure is encoded in the data that we're dealing with. Uh, in the case where we have independent and identically distributed Gaussian random vectors, uh, conditional independence relationships are encoded in what's called the precision or inverse covariance matrix, which describes the distribution of the data. Specifically, this means that a uh, value of zero in the ij entry of the inverse covariance matrix uh, indicates that components i and j of our multivariate Gaussian are conditionally independent, given the remaining components. Uh, however, uh, as I mentioned before, we're not dealing with IID data here. What we're dealing with are Gaussian stationary processes. And the structure that's typically used to describe the distribution between these processes is what's called a lagged covariance matrix. So what we want to be able to do is, uh, given an estimate of this lagged covariance matrix, uh, we want to somehow infer the structure of a conditional independence graph between these series. Uh, so this, this begs the question, uh, how is conditional independence encoded in this setup? Uh, in order to answer this question, uh, we need to rely on a key insight, which is that Time series data can be equivalently modeled in the frequency domain uh, by taking uh, the Fourier transform of the data and representing it as a linear combination of sinusoids with different frequencies, where the weights of the linear combination are these complex-valued Fourier coefficients. Uh, 
uh, if we start with the lag covariance matrix describing the distribution of our multivariate series and apply this transformation to it, we get the analogous structure in the frequency domain, uh, which is referred to as the spectral density matrix. Uh, it's worth noting that this is actually uh, a P by P by number of frequencies tensor uh, for a p-dimensional multivariate time series, uh, where each P by P matrix at each frequency describes the distribution of Fourier coefficients at that frequency. So now that we've re represented our series in the frequency domain, uh, recall that it's a zero pattern in our inverse covariance matrix that indicates conditional independence graph structure for IID data. And a similar result by Dollhouse in 2000 states that for Gaussian stationary time series, uh, the zero pattern in the inverse spectral density matrix across all frequencies encodes uh, conditional independence relationships between time series. Uh, what this means is that if the ij entry of our spectral density matrix is zero across all frequencies, uh, then components i and j of our multivariate series are conditionally independent given the remaining components. And we can use this to learn the structure of a conditional independence graphical model. So now that we know how structure is encoded in the frequency domain and the fact that we can represent our time series in this domain, uh, let me talk a little bit about how we could learn that structure from data. So one way of doing this is to write out what's called a penalized likelihood expression, which is in the form of the negative log likelihood of our data given some parameter, uh, plus a regularization penalty used to avoid overfitting to the data. Uh, I'm going to start by explaining this in the IID case. Uh, so our parameter here is the inverse covariance matrix. And uh, for Gaussian IID random vectors, uh, the negative log likelihood is simply the expression for a multivariate Gaussian, where this uh, S hat matrix is our sample covariance matrix. Uh, in order to ensure that there are zero values in our inverse covariance matrix, uh, a penalty that's typically applied in this case is uh, some form of sparsity inducing penalty. So uh, this one is the L1 norm on the off-diagonal elements of the inverse covariance matrix. And uh, together, this particular negative log likelihood and penalty constitute what's uh, commonly known as the graphical Lassa model. Uh, this is a model for uh, learning a sparse conditional independence graph from IID Gaussian uh, multivariate data. Since this is a convex model, we can leverage a lot of techniques from the field of convex optimization for uh, solving this model, and in fact, there are many existing algorithms for doing so. So now that we have the setup of uh, writing out a penalized likelihood expression and using a convex optimization algorithm to solve for it, uh, the next question is, how do we write out our likelihood in the frequency domain case? Uh, in order to answer this, uh, let's take a look at how we write this out in the time domain. So the time domain version of the likelihood corresponds to a joint probability of our multivariate series across all time points. And the analogous expression in the frequency domain is a joint probability over Fourier coefficients at all frequencies. A uh, result by Brillinger in 1981 states that uh, Fourier coefficients are asymptotically independent complex normal random vectors, which means that we can take this joint probability and approximate it as the product over frequencies of independent likelihood terms. Uh, since we know that these correspond to a complex normal distribution, uh, we can write out the likelihood for that distribution, uh, where this S sub K matrix is the P by P slice of our spectral density matrix corresponding to frequency lambda K. Uh, this actually uh, is known as the Whittle approximation to the likelihood in the frequency domain. So now that we have our likelihood uh, expression in the frequency domain, let's go back to our uh, penalized likelihood expression. Uh, in this case, we're dealing in the frequency domain, so this matrix is now our inverse spectral density matrix that we want to learn. We can uh, replace this negative log likelihood expression with the negative log likelihood uh, corresponding to our Whittle approximation. And uh, writing this out, we get an expression of the following form, which is uh, sum over frequencies of the negative log likelihood for a uh, complex normal distribution. Uh, where this S hat matrix is now our sample spectral density matrix. Uh, for, the, for the sparse penalty, uh, we can't simply use the same penalty that we were using in the IID case, since uh, recall that uh, conditional independence relationships are encoded in our inverse spectral density matrix in terms of zero patterns that are consistent across all frequencies. Uh, so what we can use in this case is a penalty that looks like this, uh, which is referred to as the group lasso penalty, and this ensures that
uh, any zero values that occur in our inverse spectral density matrix are consistent across all frequencies. Uh, together, these two components uh, describe uh, a model that exists that's known as the spectral graphical lasso model, uh, which is similar to the graphical lasso model, except that it is applied to uh, time series data for learning a sparse conditional independence graph for time series. The algorithm that we use to solve this in order to compare this to our model, which I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, is an ADMM algorithm that was described by Jung et al. when they proposed the spectral graphical lasso model. So now we have some models that can learn a sparse conditional independence graph, but neither of these incorporate the latent processes that I mentioned before that are important, particularly in the case of MEG data. Uh, so when I'm referring to latent structure in MED, MEG, what I'm talking about are uh, two properties of MEG. Uh, the first is that MEG recordings are typically taken uh, from a subject who is performing a particular task. But at the same time, of course, there's all kinds of underlying brain activity going on that's unrelated to this task that's still picked up by the recordings. Uh, this can induce artificial connections between regions of the brain that we want to be able to pull out to look at uh, the actual task-related functional connectivity graph. Uh, another issue with MEG is that the process of mapping from the raw recordings to an estimated brain activity introduces uh, what's known as point spread, which is a spatial diffusion of signal such that brain regions that are spatially located close together can seem like they're interacting when in truth they're actually not. Uh, both of these issues with MEG can be modeled in the following form where we have a set of observed variables corresponding to the brain regions of interest and these latent variables that are interacting with our observed variables such that if we marginalize out over them, we get all these spurious connections. Uh, so it's conceivable that both of these issues could be addressed by simply adding a latent component to our model. Uh, in order to do this, uh, let me talk about uh, a way that we can represent our uh, inverse covariance matrix in the IID case in terms of a sparse plus low rank decomposition. Uh, I'm going to describe this in the IID case, but uh, the same principle applies to the frequency domain. So let's say we start out with uh, a set of P observed variables and R latent variables with some conditional independence relationships between them, uh, where R is assumed to be less than P. Uh, in this setup, we can write out our uh, inverse covariance matrix uh, in this block form with blocks corresponding to interactions between observed variables, uh, between observed and hidden variables, and uh, between the hidden variables. Uh, using the Schur complement, we can uh, write out the expression for the marginal inverse covariance uh, matrix of just the observed variables, uh, which in graphical model structure might look something like this, uh, but the mathematical expression uh, ends up being uh, a sum of two matrices. One is the sparse component, uh, which is the conditional independence relationships between observed variables that we want to learn. Uh, and the other is this low rank component uh, corresponding to the spurious connections that are induced by marginalizing out over our latent variables. Uh, if we take this sparse plus low rank decomposition and plug it back into our uh, penalized likelihood expression, uh, where I'm going to call the sparse matrix psi and the low rank matrix L, uh, we get a negative log likelihood expression that looks very similar to the one we had in the graphical lasso case, uh, except that we're now representing our inverse covariance matrix as the sum of a sparse component and a low rank component. The sparse penalty that we use in this case uh, is the same one that we used before, which is the L1 norm applied to the sparse component of our decomposition, uh, except that now we want to ensure that our matrix L has low rank. Uh, so we're going to introduce this new penalty, uh, which is the trace penalty applied to our matrix. Uh, and since we're dealing with a uh, real-valued symmetric positive definite matrix, uh, in the case of L, uh, this trace penalty is equivalent to the nuclear norm penalty, which uh, may be a more familiar term, uh, which if minimized essentially uh, minimizes the rank of the L matrix. Uh, together, this negative log likelihood with these penalties uh, describes a model known as the latent variable graphical lasso. Uh, which incorporates latent variables, but is applied to uh, IID Gaussian random vectors. Uh, this is, we also solved this algorithm with, uh, uh, or excuse me, this model with an ADMM algorithm described by Ma et al. Uh, so now that I've gone over uh, the different models, as well as uh, how to uh, represent our likelihood and encode uh, conditional independence relationships in the frequency domain, uh, I can finally describe uh, the model that we proposed, which we call the latent variable spectral graphical lasso. The negative log likelihood expression for our model 
uh, it was again derived from the Whittle approximation and is very similar to the expression for the spectral graphical lasso, except that now we decompose our inverse spectral density matrix in terms of a sparse component and a low rank component. Uh, the sparse penalty we use is again the group lasso penalty applied to the sparse component uh, to ensure that any sparsity pattern we learn is consistent across all frequencies of the inverse spectral density matrix. And now we have this additional low reg penalty, which is the same trace penalty uh, applied to each frequency slice of the L component of our inverse spectral density matrix. Uh, in order to compare this model to uh, the models that I described before, uh, we derived our own set of ADMM updates to solve this convex formulation. Uh, before I get into the results, uh, let me quickly go over the stages of analysis that we typically go through when applying uh, our algorithms. Uh, we'd start with a multivariate time series data, such as uh, the data that you see here, and we'd then convert it to the frequency domain by estimating a spectral density matrix from the data. Uh, we then pass the spectral density estimate uh, through our, one of our ADMM algorithms, in this case, say, the latent variable spectral model. And then we would get our inverse spectral density matrix in the form of a sparse component plus a low rank component. We could then just look at the sparse component uh, and look at the zero pattern that was consistent across all frequencies to get the structure of our conditional independence graph. So let me co cover some uh, synthetic data results before I get to uh, applying this to the MEG data. Uh, so the data that we looked at here uh, was sampled from a multivariate uh, vector autoregressive process with uh, 149 observed variables and one hidden variable. And we applied the latent variable graphical lasso model, the spectral graphical lasso model, model and our latent variable spectral model to this data. So you can see that uh, incorporating uh, frequency do de uh, domain representation of the series, uh, such as the spectral graphical lasso does, uh, re results in uh, uh, increased performance. Uh, sorry, so I should mention that the x-axis here is uh, the number of false positive edges learned, and the y-axis is the number of true positive edges learned. So curves that are closer to the top left corner of the graph indicate better performance. Uh, so although the spectral la graphical lasso performs better, uh, our model that incorporates latent variables uh, performs even better than that. Uh, even in the case where we have one latent variable. Uh, if I increase this number to five latent variables, we can see that the spectral graphical lasso uh, starts to underperform, whereas our model remains fairly robust. Uh, so let me end by talking about uh, our model applied to the MEG data that I mentioned before. Uh, so our data was taken from an MEG auditory attention experiment, uh, where subjects were asked to uh, sit in an MEG machine such as this, and uh, attend to two different audio signals. Uh, subjects were then asked to either maintain or switch attention between signals, where switching was done either based on spatial location, so between left and right signals, or based on high or low pitch. Uh, these recordings were then passed to the same inverse solution that I mentioned before to get an estimate of uh, underlying electrical activity in the brain over time, uh, which was then passed into our algorithm. Uh, this data was collected from 16 subjects, uh, each of whom performed between 10 and 50 trials each, uh, and each trial resulted in a 149-dimensional time series. So here are some of the results of applying our latent variable spectral model to this data. Uh, the, the colored regions around the circle correspond to different regions of the brain, and the lines correspond to edges learned in the, from the conditional independence graph. So I haven't included the results of applying just the spectral model without the latent variables, uh, but we found that uh, our model actually resulted in graphs that were sparser and more interpretable. And when we uh, showed these to our neuroscience collaborators, they indicated that the sparsity pattern is sort of what they would expect for this data. Uh, we're currently still working with those collaborators to determine the scientific validity of these edges. Uh, just to wrap up, uh, I spent the beginning of the talk uh, talking about this frequency domain representation of time series, which gives us a neat way of getting conditional independence structure from the inverse uh, spectral density matrix, as well as uh, an efficient way of approximating the likelihood. Uh, we found that modeling the latent component, in addition to having this frequency do domain representation of series, gives uh, sparser and more interpretable graphs, as well as uh, better performance on synth synthetic data. Uh, and finally, I want to emphasize that these latent variable spectral models are important in a lot of real-world applications, but particularly in the domain of neuroscience. Uh, where we want to be able to model the temporal dynamics that are inherently present in neuroimaging data, uh, while also accounting for uh, latent processes to remove spurious edges and uh, give results that are more scientifically meaningful. <laughs>
Thanks. A very interesting talk. Uh, I'm wondering the one page, maybe t 12 or 13, uh, there's one equation you, you uh, try to solve, solve the matrix of the lo low rank matrix. Uh, we know when the ma there there is an item. No, 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 not this page. Maybe Sorry, uh, you're talking about the maybe or page set. Oh yeah, this, this, one? this one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, basically, uh, when the matrix is very large, uh, calculating the reverse of this matrix will cost a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So for the genes, there are about millions of genes together. How how do you make your algorithm scale? with a number of the, the, so, uh, the training we, sets. So we never actually uh, calculate the inverse of this matrix. This just describes sort of the expression that we use in order to write our uh, inverse covariance matrix in a sparse plus low rank decomposition. Um, what we'd actually learn are uh, the two matrices that you see here. So we'd, we, our algorithm would learn the psi and L matrices separately. Um, with the hope that the L matrix would sort of remove spurious connections that would otherwise be in our graph. Uh, so that inverse is never actually uh, computed. Oh, so just want to make sure I got an intuition here. So the reason why you got a, the proposed method have a sparser, result in a sparser model, is that because you add an additional low rank penalty aside from the, uh, the group lasso penalty? Yeah, exactly. So uh, in the case where we just have the sparse penalty, um, that, that low rank, sparse plus low rank decomposition uh, ends up sort of being summed together. And what we learn is edges that we want to learn, in addition to edges that are sort of induced by these conditional independence relationships that pass through latent variables. So if we pull out the latent component, then we hope to learn a, a sparser graph for the sparse component. Yeah, other questions? OK, so we're running a little bit ahead of time, so I'm going to ask you one tough question. Okay. <laughs> uh, and also wake everyone up. <laughs> uh, so, so we have also been doing uh, some work around the sparse plus low rank decomposition. And one of the things uh, that we tried, I don't know if you tried, is that uh, if we remove the latent variable, we just go ahead and generate the time series with all the observed variables. Mm -hmm. Using the sparse plus low rank decomposition, we're still able to get improvement. And it's not like significant, but uh, marginal improvement consistently. So uh, I first, I don't know if you have conduct experiments like that. Um, but later, what we find out is that uh, this improvement was actually uh, due to the correlated noise in time series data because all these time series data when they were collected uh, there may be some equipment noise or there may be something that uh, in a system when they collect the data uh, that's out there. Uh, so I, I, I guess my question to you is I wonder first you do any experiments without any latent variable, try your method works, observe something similar as what we did, uh, and if so, then do you have any good explanation for the, what's happening? Um, so yes, we did try applying uh, the latent variable models to data that was generated uh, that didn't have uh, any latent component. Um, we found that the performance was roughly the same. Usually our synthetic JDR was generated with very little noise. Um, but it's, uh, it's understandable that, this, that the improved performance could be due to the low rank structure sort of pulling out this noise. Um, that's sort of something that we expect to happen um, in the case of the MEG data, uh, where the, the, a lot of the latent structure comes from the noise that happens because of signal spilling into different brain regions. And so I imagine that, that that could result in improved performance, even in the case where there is no inherent latent structure. Thanks. <laughs>